Okay. Uh, <clears throat> good morning, everyone. I've been told to speak slowly, and you will have to speak slowly because there is simultaneous, simultaneous translation going on, so we have to speak slowly. Um, so good morning, everyone. It's my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker of the day. Um, it's Professor uh, Ian Hickey of, of Sydney. Um, who else could keep us awake uh, so early in the morning? I'm sure he's going to have all the energy it takes to wake us up so early in the morning. Um, his talk is very much in, in, um, in phase with IEPA uh, wish to broaden the focus and incorporate early intervention into other domains of uh, psychiatry and to expand beyond um, the limits of uh, psychosis. And the title of his talk uh, is uh, Tracking Clinical and Functional Outcome in Young People with Emerging Anxiety, Mood and uh, Psychotic Disorders. It's all yours. Buongiorno. Speak slowly. It's not possible. <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> I have many things I want to say, but most importantly, I want to start by thanking the organisers for the invitation. It's a great opportunity for me to talk at this particular time in this particular society and its movement with this very rich tradition of what it's done, but at a really critical time for considering where it goes next. I also want to say grazie mille for the, you know, fabulous hosting of Anna and her colleagues here in Milan. It's fine with me if you have the meeting here every time, you know, in northern Italy. It would be very good. It is an important time, I think, for everyone to think about at the national levels they operate and the international societies they support, just where we are at and where we need to go. One of my key roles in Australia really is my role with the National Mental Health Commission which is about fundamentally saying we want to do much more in the mental health area, but is what you do very useful? And useful meaning what is its effect on the outcomes of interest? The great danger in all our societies and in mental health like other areas of health is just to have more activity, to argue for more money, more clinics, more people doing things that we believe is actually having a significant impact on the lives of people we look after. As Pat McGorry knows well, as we spend a lot of time in the company of important people in our national capital, people are very enthusiastic about support. They just have a small question. Does it make any difference to the outcome in those particular areas? Oh, before I go too far, I always forget to thank the other people that really matter, <laughs> who are not here with me today, who really lead our particular work. Liz Scott, who leads our clinical team, Daniel Hermans, our research in neuropsychology and imaging, and Shane Cross, in particular, our health services areas. There are so many things to think about, but the one actually that is starting on there that dominates our national thinking, and we now have our Prime Minister saying every day, it's about the mental wealth. It's about what do you do at a population level and a clinical level that grows the wealth of our nation? And that's about people and their cognitive and their emotional capacities. The other issues in this talk, and if I go really slowly, I'll get to about number two of this <laughs> in the allocated time, is that it is our belief, it's our assumption, our working hypothesis that transdiagnostic and clinical staging approaches are key step forwards and they matter to the people we take care of because they're about the personalisation of their care. And they're much more important than putting people in groups. So they matter at the personal level. We really need much better longitudinal studies and interventional studies. But the issue is going to be in the field who gets into those studies and what outcomes we track. In our own data, I will draw on the longitudinal twin and clinical studies that we are particularly associated with to look at those issues in population samples in the twins, but in clinical samples in our headspace and specialist settings. We're very interested in the underlying moderating neurobiology, which I'll, I'll talk to. But I guess the bottom line of all of this in our thinking is that changing symptoms may not change outcomes. And what we've got to change is outcomes. And we are still making a very strong argument in our country that if you want to change outcomes, by definition, you have to intervene earlier. <laughs> you can't intervene at a late outcome and say that you're making a big difference to the outcomes. There needs to be a great 
more emphasis on what are the social treatments that deliver those outcomes in our view, not so much what are the specific medical or psychological treatments that change symptoms. And we need new perspectives on what are the underlying drivers. I think we've had simplistic assumptions that we find the diagnostic categories, we'll find the pathophysiologies and the specific treatments. Most of our work in the moderating neurobiological area is inconsistent, does not support that view. It suggests we may be focused on the wrong things. And another really, really important issue, which I'll only touch on very lightly, is whatever we do from the start should be thought of as being able to be implemented at scale. Far too much of our work, I think, is dominated by doing small proof of principle trials in a highly specialised setting and then saying to the health service world and the political world, you must deliver this thing everywhere <laughs> without much evidence that actually, if it were delivered, it could be delivered, it was feasible and it would be effective in those particular settings. Um, some of you know I'm a particular advocate of the way in which new technologies may assist us to do both of those. Actually maintain the fidelity of what we do but also deliver it at scale. So to go back a little bit to where I started, for us we're very grateful to the British for actually taking the concept of mental health and turning it into mental wealth. And that very much within that kind of setting, saying very overtly, you know, five words really helps, helps rather than 500 pages. Early interventions will be the key. Didn't say in that exactly what those early interventions are, but actually if you're going to make a difference, you need to get in there and do that. So what dominates our discussion in Australia, unlike other areas of health, isn't premature death, it's the cost of disability. It's the number of lives, years of life live with disability. And you get this Twin Peaks phenomena of basically the onset of that disability in childhood, but particularly playing out in adolescence, and then associated with ageing. And it's interesting, the ageing-related disability is actually changing due to better intervention in midlife and better services. So that people are now living older with less disability into their 80s, etc. The big question for our governments and for much of our research, I'd say, in neuroscience and in mental health, is can we change those patterns? And to change those patterns, one needs very specific child, youth, and we won't discuss in this setting, ageing. Particularly in this particular area, one needs child and youth strategies that are likely to be effective to change those disability curves. I'm very grateful to Jan Scott and David Fowler and others, unfortunately Jan can't be with us this week, who's been a key partner in this continuous dialogue and pointing out within things like the medical professions of the BMJ that the bigger economic priorities in our countries, and very much led by OECD thinking in this area, is the issue that David Fowler was raising yesterday about those young people that are not in employment, education and training, the NEETS group, and what is really underpinning their failure to transition from school and support and family into being independent, productive members of society. And there are many questions about that that remain unresolved. But it's the area that our societies want to invest in, and they look to us to provide more insights into that particular area. What's been really troubling me over recent years is our actual failure collectively in the studies that we do and the areas in which we work to actually talk about outcomes very clearly to have clinical trials that are largely still tied to symptom counts and remission counts. And even in the really good areas, in the areas that have been championed by these particular areas, our focus is largely on the last of these. Can we somehow prevent a particular illness, in this case largely focused on schizophrenia, from developing? You know, and that's a really hard and tough kind of issue. I'd suggest, in fact, it's not nearly as important as actually what is the positive outcome how do we take people in trouble and make sure that they achieve economic and social participation in that key transitional group? That's actually what people themselves, what the family and the broader society cares about the most. There are other sets of issues and certainly reducing self-harm and suicidality. So in our clinical settings, there's suicidality and self-harm and fear about that that drives a lot of healthcare seeking. And of course, from a society point of view, fear about self-harm and suicide and of course the occurrence of teenage suicide is an absolutely devastating experience for all those affected. So all of our services and all of our efforts need to remain very clear about reducing those sets of issues as well. Increasingly, of course, the comorbidity with substance abuse is recognised and the need to prevent those people developing substance abuse and actually missed opportunities. Great friend and colleague Kathleen Merikangas pointed out 20 years ago that if we dealt with mental health problems earlier in adolescence, we would reduce a lot of the subsequent later adolescent alcohol and substance abuse problems. But our failure to do so just guarantees that we deal with much more complex comorbidity in a significant proportion down the track. And in recent years, 
the emphasis on improving physical health outcomes, that in fact our populations die early from cardiovascular disease, develop metabolic complications, have impaired lives and high healthcare costs because of our failure to deal with those trajectories. So in all the work we're associated with when we talk about outcomes, that one at the end tends to be the one we talk about the least. But in these particular groups, even in these really what I would say very progressive groups, it's that thing which is the most contentious and the most difficult, which reoccupies the most stuff. I said in a talk earlier in the week, I had one success in the last year with our current health minister, I think in Australia, who's struggled to understand quite what we're up to with arguing for more investment in mental health, because she's been told it's about actually preventing schizophrenia, and then been told we don't have a lot of evidence that we prevent schizophrenia through earlier intervention. As distinct from saying, actually, it's about living a better life, whether you have symptoms or not, and intervening early enough to make sure that the social outcome is good. And she said, well, that's just like any other illness, isn't it? It's like how well you live with the problems you've got, particularly as you age. I said, exactly. So she said, it's like other chronic illnesses. I said, exactly. Because, well, I understand that. If we can actually have a better life, despite the symptoms that we have, that's well worth investing in at a personal level as well as at a social level. The other two big issues that are driving us, in addition to the outcome issue, is people want better care. People are no longer happy in the 21st century with line up with the clinic for schizophrenia, line up with the clinic for bipolar disorder, line up the clinic for eating disorders, <laughs> and get the standard care. Just get the model. Your, you, your family, your illness will have to fit the model. We've got the schizophrenia clinic, we've got the PTSD clinic, we've got the eating disorders clinic, we've got the bipolar clinic, and we do the same thing to all of you. Take a ticket, get the care. It doesn't work very well in other areas of medicine. In other areas of medicine have tried to move on to that through different strategies to personalise the care in different ways, both at the biological areas through for things like genetic targeting, but also in other areas like the care of breast cancer to be much more comprehensive in the nature of that particular care. So it's a big driving issue for do that. To do that is not easy, and we are arguing particularly to do that, there are two key concepts that we need to incorporate into this area. One is of trajectories. People are on life courses, some which become evident in terms of the disability or risk factors in childhood, some that become more evident in adolescence, and it's very important where they are actually going, not in big group data, but individually. You know, whenever you go to the care of the doctor, you don't want to know what happened to the last 100 people who had a heart attack. I want to know what's going to happen to me. <laughs> You know, and what is optimal for me? I don't want to be told, you know, I've got a 70% chance because of seven out of the 10 people like this generally go that way. I want to know, do you know anything better than that? I could have read that myself in any of the available literature. I want to know, do you know, at a clinical level, at a specialised level, can you do more specifically for me? And I think the issue of understanding trajectories is a critical one for us in the continuities and discontinuities in this field. The other that we've really tried to take into practice is clinical staging. And just to knock that idea off straight from the other areas of medicine, you know, that staging may matter to the selection of treatments and more appropriate areas. Clearly, clearly, 14-year-olds with developing psychotic syndromes are not the same as 45-year-olds with established schizophrenia. And simply trying to make them the same or talk about them the same or find the same biology or the same social strategies or assume they'll respond in the same way to treatments is likely to and has led, I suggest, to failure. So these are two issues that we are trying to take forward as part of the pathway to making care more personalised as we go with that. So they talk about, from a biological point of view, we're interested in what might be the underlying pathological pathways. We're pretty convinced they don't respond very well at the moment to what we use currently diagnostically. An important thing to stay in this thing as we go in these care models is to say that what we think is clinical staging is not traditionally what our health systems talk about in terms of stepped care. Everyone with all our problems should go through a primary care system and then a certain psychological care system. And then when it's all failing, a more specialised system. The other thing that our health minister has said, and she didn't say this because of me or Pat, she actually said it spontaneously. <laughs> I don't think she understood quite what she was saying. But she said, it is about getting the right amount of care when you present it first, isn't it? I said, exactly. You know, if you've got breast cancer, you don't get a little stage care and then a little more, a little surgery and then a little chemotherapy and then a little more and a little more and we'll wait to see if it got worse and then we'll give you what you should have had or we could have known at the start. So, as I was expressing earlier in the week, I have great reservations about some of the primary care models or that modern mental health in the 21st century can simply fit into a 1950s British NHS primary care model. 
which we happen to have been sort of tried to mimic in Australia or we think has great value. I don't think that's the way forward, actually, in the 21st century. People expect, quite rightly, to have a better system up front and then get what is appropriate, not too much, not too little, but hopefully personalised, that has the best chance of delivering care at that point. The next big challenge, though, is how do you do that at scale? So my earlier point, this can't just be for 10 people while 1,000 people go missing and don't receive appropriate care or are sent away in particular ways. So when we design these things, the big sort of movements we're doing in Australia like Headspace, the things I'm particularly keen about, how do we actually use e-health strategies to advance this area, are what I think we should give consideration to. So underlying our particular work is just a fundamental lack of belief. We've gone from being agnostic to being actually atheist. We're just really against diagnostic categories in a big way because of the clusters and dimensions that are fundamentally running here in terms of the presentations we see, but we suggest the underlying pathophysiologies themselves are not distinct, they're not mutually exclusive, they're overlapping sets of processes that play out in the developmental pathways affecting largely risk to psychotic disorders, in the anxious depressive, the mood regulation, the environmental responsiveness, and in my personal favourite ones in terms of circadian type systems that affect body clocks and affect mood and physiological daily regulation. Let's go over the time. So we are pretty preoccupied with this notion of trajectories, what childhood risks might exist, how do they play out through the key transition in adolescence, when's the presentation of various sets of syndromes, and what pathways might people be on. We've tried to take that pathway model, and I was desperate to find a picture of Jan here to show here, with others internationally, to say, can we translate these into clinical type models? So in the staging type idea, what's been really critical is this notion of 1B, and as Mary Cannon was looking at, why call it that? We'll come to what it might, we might actually call it. But some critical point at which you see symptoms and disability, but it's not too late. The person does not have a well-established syndrome with well-established disability, that there's a real opportunity to intervene. There's some thresholding. So this is not just a continuous dimension. And our assumption at this particular stage is that the disorders themselves and certainly associated disability is not necessarily inevitably progressive that there's a serious possibility of actually stopping further progression in disability or illness course at this particular point. So that's critical in all of our work because from a service point of view, if that's true, they're the ones you want to get the best treatment early on. They're the early stage breast cancers. They've got something bad, but at a particular stage, if the setting, if the combination of treatments is right, you probably have the greatest opportunity of the best outcome. And if you let those run, you probably have the greatest risk of progression to worse outcomes. Now, Mary Cannon was telling me the other week, you can't go around calling people 1B. It just doesn't have a ring to it, you know, kind of why? Couldn't you guys come up with a better name? So I'd like to start a naming competition. Perhaps there's an Italian name that would be much better for this type of thing. A Milano name, you know, something that needs, you know, AC Milan or something. It needs something that engages people in the particular thing. We know what we don't want. We don't want this to be called an at-risk mental state. Now, I can't say exactly what David Fowler said we should call it, because I think the swearing may not kind of carry over in the translational thing. But let me say, people are already ill and they're already impaired. Now, we technically may understand they're at risk for further syndromal development, but that is a terrible word in the public. And it's led to a lot of trouble in Australia, and it said, why are you treating people who are at risk? Why are you bringing them in the clinical care settings? Why are you medicalising those things? Why are you stigmatising those things? So I think that's an appalling name for what we're talking about in this particular area, even though technically we know what it means. What we don't want is any more acronyms and see, you know, for these particular issues. Please, <laughs> no more. And then papers about comparing this one with that one. Now, I come from the... Uh, Phil, I was bipolar and, you know, whatever. We're loose in this territory. We now have bipolar at-risk stakes, bar and other things. I'm sure shortly we'll have six more to match. You know, we've invented a whole new language. And, and unfortunately, each one is tied then to the specialist kind of ideas of progression to one syndrome. With this sort of 1B thing, we're not assuming that they have specific syndromes at this time, or that they are prodromal. The prodromal assumes you know where they're going. They're prodromal for a specific disorder. We're not saying that. 
It's also not so good to say they're sub-syndrome. Again, it kind of discounts the problem, you know, some arbitrary threshold, when in fact, from a symptom point of view, a healthcare point of view, as I'll show you later, from a lot of other issues, they're already quite unwell. Also, you know, we don't want to have a very specific label because the danger is it leads to, okay, everybody's got to have their own specialist system in these particular areas, a psychosis one, a bipolar one, for all the at-risk states, et cetera. So the service development point of view, that never really works. Discussing with David, it's also not true to say that they are simply neat, that they're simply disabled. The course of disability is fluctuating and, as David was saying yesterday, variable, depending on social circumstances and everything, in certain populations. It's this combination of disability and mental health problems. So we're not going to simply call them neat either. They're not the other two groups. They're not the people with the stage two disorders in our model who generally you could attach a specific diagnosis to and that would be helpful and explanatory in those areas. Um, they're not also the little, the, what we call the 1As, or those who have mental health symptoms and health-seeking behaviour and distress, but little impairment. So, and, and as Alison Jung pointed out, uh, and we discussed this earlier in the week, it's important when you do these things, even in the naming, that you don't do harm, and that through the naming you don't necessarily drag people into assumptions about care in the, or attach stigma in those things. We tend to therefore, at this point, but I'm happy to have this replaced by anything more useful, talk about attenuated syndromes. They're syndromal, they're not just symptom checklists, they're syndromal, but they, and they resemble in a number of characteristics what we would see in those other areas, but they have not developed full syndromal characteristics, and certainly not full syndromal characteristics in terms of persistence of disability. So, you know, just, we know what they are. They're those who are already ill, but don't get good care, because of course these are the people who are classically excluded from specialist services and primary care, and we would argue they have not been the subject of sufficient professional or serious research interest. So the two sets of areas that we push, I want to present data from to support some of these things are from our large clinical cohort collected in Sydney, and some of it overlaps with some of the um, data we also have from our colleagues with Pat in, and Origin in Melbourne, based around our headspace and, and clients care centres. The other is from a large adolescent twin study run by Nick Martin and colleagues, which I've been party to for the last two decades in Brisbane. Now we run those two studies concurrently for very good reasons. One's obviously population-based and genetically informative, the other is clinical. And the issues about where are the overlaps between what we do and these people we bring into care, it's important to have these sets of studies running concurrently. But the model that we're testing throughout of this is a trans-diagnostic and a staging model. And it is about, are these modifiable paths? A little different to the um, picture that Pat showed earlier in the week is in our particular model, there's a higher overall population prevalence earlier on. Not everyone does progress from adolescent disorders to more severe disorders or necessarily carries the disorders through to child. So there is an issue of a lot more people to treat and a lot less clarity about what is wrong. But it is the focus, it is our target, is really to sit in that 1B2, in those attenuated syndromes, those early phases of major disorders. And that's where we conduct our neurobiological research as well. And then to try to track over time, where do people actually go? Not just syndromally, but actually functionally. So just to draw a little data from the twin study, because we've got to a key phase of that particular study, which started back in the 1990s, it recruits at age 12, it follows through to age 30. In fact, we have another phase of it now going through to about average age of 35, for about 3,500 twins at entry. Some work that Jan Scott's been doing in the analysis of pathways in the data, just early in the course of data, all I want to highlight here is during the early adolescent period, the variety in pathways. <laughs> People are going in different directions all the time. Some people are quite okay when they come into adolescence, but have significant upswings by 16 to become quite significant cases. Others were cases as childhood, they don't all persist into adulthood. So the change in mood and somatic status during that early adolescent period is very clear. Better understanding what's actually going on and understanding the trajectories is a particular issue before we make prognostications about where people are exactly going. In that actual twin study now, we've just finished the data lockdown on what's called the 19 and up phase, but the average age of people is actually 26 at this particular point, so through the major age of onset of many of these sets of uh, disorders. I just want to highlight across the whole adolescent pre period, the two big disorders that are very obvious during those particular phases are the major depressive disorders and social anxiety. Social anxiety much not taken seriously or understood so much often dismissed in this particular area, but often associated with quite significant behavioural change. They're the sort of big two in classical, and these are DSM-5, actual diagnosis. 
but actually other symptoms are really common. So psychotic symptoms are in 7% of those teenagers over that particular period. And a point that was raised earlier by Mary Cannon earlier in the week and in our data, they're not all in 19, 20, 21 year olds. A lot have had psychotic symptoms right throughout their adolescence. They didn't just happen at the end of adolescence. Same for brief hypomanic and activation syndromes. In fact, they're more common. In fact, having all five of the particular items we use in the screener, you see in 18% of teenagers having two or three days of those sets of types of syndromes. Now again, a point pointed out by Kathleen Merikangas, they don't suddenly become manic at 1920. They've actually often had periods of brief hypomania reactivation quite throughout their adolescence. So the idea we have in a lot of those sort of staging models, there's all non-specific symptoms and there's suddenly the emergence of, ma of mania or suddenly the emergence of psychosis. There might be the constellation or the crystallization into a syndrome of we call psychosis or but mania at 18, 19, 20. But a lot of the other stuff's been there throughout. It's actually been quite present from uh, the adolescent, throughout the adolescent period. What becomes really important isn't tracking each individual thing. So what I love about the twin study is being able to look at the patterns of comorbidity. And the bottom line is, of course, what we really want to know, when we're thinking about who's at greatest risk, who's really in the middle of these particular things. And I think to give rough estimates, because this matters to a kind of population planning idea. Only about 2% actually have all three of hypomania, depressive, and psychotic type symptoms. So to actually have all three of those things running concurrently isn't that common. And there's about 6% that have at least two of those running concurrently. Now I'd be arguing very strongly, it's that 8% at a population level we should be thinking about as really requiring probably that from, at least from a symptom point of view or a syndrome or development point of view, most attention. And to be thinking about that's probably the scale of population planning that we actually need. We're very lucky, and we're talking about population planning, to be part of a wider set of network. And I really did want to highlight the roles here of Jan Scott and Kathleen Merikangas. Jan in the UK and in Europe with her colleagues uh, in Switzerland, and, and Kathleen with her colleagues in Switzerland and the United States in focusing on these sets of issues. And at that area, with a strong mood disorders focus, but also a strong disability focus, so the anxiety, depression, and mood disorders, is a developing network that's very helpful. Not as nearly as well established as your own network, but I think very relevant to this style of work. And we're very grateful, in fact, to Pat, of course, for being very open to actually have these sets of discussions. Pat's own leadership in our own country, for those who don't know it, this is Pat being awarded his, order of, uh, his uh, Australian of the Year in our particular thing. You know, it's been transformative in Australia to actually have this higher level of community recognition to actually lead this issue. We're very grateful to Pat and his colleagues for actually taking on this broader agenda. We've been lucky to have, in fact, National Medical Research Council support for really talking about better treatment in the early intervention framework. And the work that we've done, I'd particularly like to say, is led by, clinically by my partner, Liz Scott, working with our Headspace services. We're lucky to have a national network that allows us to recruit into these particular issues. And we are also lucky to have then our specialist services sitting behind that. So we're continuously trying to track neurobiologically through scanning and other sets of issues, what is happening to those early phases to link the neuroscience with the clinical sets of developments. We've got a lot of assumptions. I'll show you some data. We've got a lot of assumptions about where we think this is kind of going and some data to work from. We've got to have some idea about where to have this poor prognosis. Is it true that people differentially progress through certain stages? So in the data we have about transitions at the moment in these particular periods, over 12 month periods, about five to 10% of the ones that we don't have disability but have fairly non-specific anxious and depressive symptoms over a 12 month period will progress to a later stage, which means progress to more disability, frankly, and more syndromal type characteristics. The bit we're really interested in is this 1B group. And we have reasonable data from two sets of studies now that over a 12 month period, about 15% of those progress. So in terms of planning sort of prevention and progression type studies, it's a reasonable number of transition rates if, if the study you're doing is large enough. If you've got enough people coming in the front door, then it's transition rates to talk about actually changing. A lot of the assumptions here is that those where we do intervene early enough in course, we actually can change the functional outcome. But actually, the more and more we look at the data, you know, there's a really serious question. Are we already too late for a large number that we are seeing? Our average age is about 19 in these particular sets of studies. Groups, as particular groups in that area, when they present, already have well-established disability, well-established cognitive dysfunction, as well as quite hard crystallised syndromes. You know, 
in truth, for a lot of the people saying we're not that early. Now, when they got those things, did they develop in early childhood? Did they develop in late childhood? Did they develop in early adolescence? We can't answer from these particular data sets. So we don't know that's all necessarily a decline. Much of it may have been very much neurodevelopmental, but it's very late in the piece for many of the people in these so-called early intervention services. We're trying to move to more specialised models as, as we go by being more neurobiologically informed. And there really is an issue of tracking longer term outcomes. As we do these studies, we have to set the situation up to do them better. Now, there's a sm small joke only known as those who had dinner last night, is how do you make tracking long term outcome more fashionable? I don't know if any of you noticed this wearing of active wear in public, which I entirely don't understand. To make something that's apparently unfashionable, fashionable. <laughs> And make it. We need Italian assistance with this, you know, some great branding to go with it, La Perla or something, you know, to make something that shouldn't be seen actually seen, which is the long term tracking and engage people, clinicians and services. Now, I'll show you later on, but we're very interested in personal tracking devices, other things that you do do that are attached to people in various ways that allow you to know with their consent what is actually happening. We need five year data and 10 year data and 15 year data where people are actually participating and modifying their behaviour as well as they go. So the data from the programs I'll, I'll show you relate to our, our particular programs in Sydney, this is the 7,000 people. About 40% of those people have complex comorbid anxiety and depressive disorders. I just hate it, hate it, does that translate into Italian? Hate it, when they're referred to as worried well, or at risk, or not so bad, or they've had a breakup with their girlfriend, or they have trouble at school. They're in really serious complex situations already with these attenuated syndromes with disability. About 20% of what we see already have pretty clearly uh, bipolar or psychotic spectrum syndrome, syndromal type features that are well established when they present. About 1,000 of these groups have been involved in our neuropsychological and brain imaging studies, uh, 2,500 in clinical trials of one sort or another, and we now have emerging longitudinal data on about 80% of the sample, at least in the short term. Just to say something about that is that on the, of the whole, those particular people are about age 19, and the important thing to pick up uh, an issue David Fowler was raising yesterday, it's about what they don't do. So in our particular samples, they, the particular groups here spend seven or eight days a month not active in their proper function, whatever their proper function is, school, employment, etc. That's a large chunk of time. As David was saying yesterday, you can actually track inactivity. It's not that hard. When young people are not doing stuff, it's a big problem. So they have this well-established pattern of disability. We are conducting clinical trials of various sites. When we do clinical trials at this stage, we're not doing it across the whole group. We tend to do it as we've done with PAT, with the neuropro samples, within psychotic syndromes, with melatonergic agents within the circadian areas, and with other areas in, in various forms of CBT and, and uh, pharmacologic augmented CBT in the anxious areas. So we're trying to track additional clinical trials within that particular framework. But there is a bit of an issue if you get too narrow in the selection for particular trials. We have published quite a lot of data now about the baseline characteristics of these people, really emphasising their degree of disability, the extent to which they have concurrent substance abuse, their suicidality and their underlying neurobiological characteristics. Our work that Jan has done with us in looking at predictors of disability within these particular settings, this one with BMJ, you know, things emerge that you may not otherwise think. So not just the symptoms they have, but things like concurrent actual nicotine use and cannabis use actually being some of the stronger predictors of disability, at least from a clinical point of view, in these particular samples. Interestingly, the one area in which we actually have some of the greatest enthusiasm for not being too late is actually in the cardiovascular metabolic area, where actually we find that this group is not more fat already. Unlike the early psychosis populations, not more fat already than the rest of the population. Their big cardiovascular risk factor is their smoking behaviour, which is three to four times higher than the general population, and yet, and yet is not a focus of intervention. We talk about their metabolic health endlessly, but actually we've been spectacularly unsuccessful with dealing with their smoking behaviour. Um, so the characteristics of, these, of the whole bigger sample, while anxiety and depression is the common diagnosis, comorbidity is actually the rule. And that psychotic and manic symptoms along with that in periods of activation are quite common. So across our whole particular samples, uh, and particularly the ones that come into our most targeted trials, about 50%, uh, uh, sorry, about 30% are overtly stage uh, 1B and about 50% are in these more advanced places. But across the whole sample, suicidal ideation, alcohol and drug comorbidity, and already, already a quarter 
receiving welfare support from our government at the time they arrive. Needless to say, from a governmental perspective, that's the big one. <laughs> you know, can you do anything about that? Because the issue is once you transition to welfare in most of our issues, the chance that you'll ever leave is very low. And it's not necessarily about preventing people getting to welfare, it's about you know, better lives before that actually happens. Oh, I was going to say, just on the neurobiological issue, and I'll just show some data very quickly at this point, we have evidence that, in fact, the neuro degree of neurobiological uh, change more or less matches the stage of illness. So early stages, the 1As are not that different from normals on a whole range of measures. The 1Bs are different from normals, and the 2s in developed syndromes are the most further away from normal. So we see these clusters of relevance. And I really want to emphasise some issues around neuropsychology here. So we're really, as we do these clinical outcome studies, looking at the neuropsychology, their brain uh, characteristics and their circadian biology is the big three that we invest in. What's important about the neuropsychology is one in relation to stage, you have the normals, you have the one, uh, the one Bs, uh, and then you have the, those with more advanced sets of areas. There are some interesting specific issues, but the general issue is the degree of neuropsychological dysfunction matches the clinical stage. We've been interested in the predictors of these particular sets of issues, and just for time's sake, I'll just skip through the key sort of areas. You can do this in a univariate way and say, to what degree does neurocognitive function itself predict social, uh, cognitive characteristics predict social and occupational function? The answer, which I can see that, is very strongly. You can say symptoms also predict function to a lesser degree, and substance misuse has a small but significant effect in univariate models. When you go to the multivariate models, and amongst the spaghetti diagram, what really matters is actually the extent to which two things, neurocognitive function, you see this, this value is here, 0.36, and depressive and anxiety symptoms, 0.25, are actually the two big drivers of, in fact, neuro, of social and occupational dysfunction from a neurocognitive point of view. In all this work that we do, specific diagnosis itself isn't a big predictor. So depressive symptoms and neurocognitive function are. And we've been looking at the effect of those through uh, my postdoc colleague, uh, Rico Lee, on longitudinal course in these particular sets of areas. So when you look over time, over year periods, it's the baseline cognition that actually is the strongest predictor of the 12-month function, along with, of course, the baseline function on its own sense. So coming in doing badly predicts doing badly. But baseline neurocognition is the other big predictor of, in fact, longer-term function. Um, this is just some of the data which is in publication, and I won't go into the details here, but basically it's about the extent to which you don't see separation around diagnoses over follow-up, but you do around neurocognitive characteristics. There are certain kinds of neurocognitive characteristics. Some change, like speed and attention, associated with better function if you do it successfully. Others don't change, and if they don't change, function stays bad. In the MRI studies we've been looking at, we see various degrees of frontal lobe changes in the attenuated syndromes, uh, and which are different from normal but less severe. The point here is also in these 1B groups in, in data that's at this stage unpublished, that that is progressive. If those people progress over time, so does their frontal lobe change. So that kind of finding is not unique to schizophrenia or unique to the other disorders. It's in this particular set of issues. We see disturbed microarchitecture in white matter, again, more severely in those with more severe disorders. We're really interested with Kathleen Merikangas and others in circadian biology and its continuous measurement. It's easily measured with all sorts of wearable and active devices in various ways that people can incorporate into their lives and use that data to feed back about their own particular system, work with clinicians on that. What we see in that area is the extent to which delayed sleep phase and circadian perturbance is associated with more severe uh, sets of disorders. And that is not just a behavioural characteristic. It is an underlying disturbance of the circadian clock so in dim light melatonin um, measurements, basically those with more severe disorders do not have a normal uh, onset. And this, this stage one melatonin curve is itself shifted from a normal control curve, which is more steep in those who don't have any situation. This is also matched by core body temperature changes, which we've just published. It's an, it is an underlying, it's not just a behavioural characteristic. The underlying circadian driver is perturbed. It's late in the day, it's more disturbed in terms of activity, and it's more variable from day to day. So it doesn't have the same rhythmicity that actually people without these disorders have. And we've been looking at ESIX, its potential to predict longer term changes in symptoms, which we've just published. And again, I won't go into the details, but basically these characteristics of, of disturbance of the, the clock actually affect cognition, but they also affect longitudinal course in terms of those who still have unstable clocks, 
actually have more symptoms and more relapse over time. In a, uh, an important paper in our group, Frankie Affino, one of, who's Italian, Frankie Affino, who uh, has just published a review of all the issues we've been looking at in terms of biological predictors of the various domains I've been talking about. And for those who are really interested, it's a long discourse on where, what sort of neurobiology may underpin the sort of issues in which we are most interested in. But to come to the end, or the final part of my talk, I'm really interested in what are the treatment patterns. And here's Shane Cross, he's a PhD psychologist but runs our health headspace services, has taken a lot of these ideas into, into implementation at a health service level and tried to look at what is the effect of the outcomes of what we do. Now, taking staging into those particular issues, when we took staging in, one of the things we wanted to do was to make sure that people didn't get too much medicine, too much pharmacology too early in the course of illness, so there'll be a stronger emphasis on psychological interventions. And that is basically what has happened. So you can see that the 1A people here get more psychology and get less medication. The 1Bs, they still get psychology, but they increasingly get more medical intervention. So actually overtly saying to people, make these differentiations and start to make selection biases. What we've tried to say is don't over-medicalise too early. Provide intervention, but don't over-medicalise. In studying what happens in terms of symptoms and disability, I'm going to highlight a few kind of features. Look at how long people stay in care. Everyone, from a symptom point of view, basically gets symptom relief. You know, contact with the services, some degree of psychology, engaged sort of services. In terms of the distress that people have, it goes down. What's really important, though, is the extent to which their functioning goes up or not, relative to how much treatment they receive. So though the 1A people don't have so much disability, as a consequence, when they stay in treatment, either for short periods or longer periods, that disability doesn't change much, because they weren't very disabled to start with. What's really worrying us is the other phenomena. Those who come in at low disability, at, at significant disability, low SOFA scores, but only receive short intervention, they may have symptom relief, but they have very little impact on their actual function, <laughs> on their disability. Those who stay with us longer, there is a significant continuing improvement in their disability. In our health system, that's when we say, arrivederci. <laughs> They're still not very well. You know, they've still got SOFA scores of only 60. You know, so we actually then, having shown that if we stick with people, they're improving, that's where, we, that's where we drop out. We haven't yet built systems that actually stick with people in a significant way through those early phases to see whether, if we kept going, those curves would continue to improve. We should really think about how we do these things. We've been studying these particular issues in relation to put work with the Pats Group in Melbourne and our transition studies. This is one of the really important papers just published by our colleagues, is that really, despite what we do in changes in symptoms, and I'll show you a slide in a moment, when we change depressive symptoms, there's some benefit to that, but actually those who come in largely with their NEAT status, despite all the things we're doing in terms of the course of their depressive symptoms, their NEAT status doesn't change much, except some people who weren't become NEATs. So a lot of those who are NEATs already, we aren't going very far. So we're doing a lot of stuff at the symptom relief, the distress relief, changing symptom patterns, doing the specific reduction, in this case of depressive symptoms, but we aren't making a big impact on one of our key variables. Do they go to school or work? We then try to take this model into the uh, whole model of developing services, and for those who are interested, Shane's elaborated how we do this, how we actually structure the service through its assessment, through tracking, to make key decisions about where we go with treatment, and how we provide treatment. And just some data out of this particular group, largely focusing on this stage 1B area about what really happens to people. He's been studying the patterns of transitions across those particular kind of areas and really seeing this is where you get sort of 20% of the 1Bs actually transitioning over time. But the important point about that is looking at transitions in this particular group is just to say that most of the transitions that are happening are actually happening early. So while generally most people are benefiting in symptom relief. There is a group that's coming in who's on a downward trajectory when they come in. And we need to stick with that group in particular because they're actually deteriorating and make sure that we don't pull out too early in that particular area. Just finally, we think we can go to scale. We're very lucky in Australia to have had uh, Jane Burns on behalf of all of our organisations lead a large corporate research centre focusing on new technologies in this particular area. We want to bring people in. We want to make available to online. Things like, you know, when you're thinking about suicide, which rather than say when you're thinking about disability, when you're thinking about something you're really scared of, might you be able to come through these gates and get into services earlier? We're creating personalised kind of hubs. You can see this, many of them have, a, this says Ian, many of them have pictures. I haven't got my own picture here. It's not a very attractive one. You know, to actually show, make your own e-health environment, 
produce your own dashboard of what is really wrong, looking at not just your symptoms, but your substance use, your overall physical health, other sets of issues. Start using online technologies like apps to try to moderate these things. But importantly, we've now developed online clinics as part of this particular thing, where we create profiles of what is actually happening, interact with people in particular ways as we go. And this particular thing I just want to highlight is a key screen. This is what the person is putting in themselves through self-report mechanisms. This is actually a flagging system to the clinician. So by the time they see the person online, it's already been flagged what might be the big issue, like psychotic-like symptoms. This kid's expressing psychotic-like symptoms. Go find out whether they've really got a psychotic syndrome. You know, actually focus on the key set of issues rather than a broader set of narratives or other things and use skilled clinicians more effectively. We're involved in a validation study of this compared with normal assessments. And just a key point here of the validation study we've been doing is that actually the online system with a skilled clinician actually works better than our in-person clinic at picking up this 1B particular group. We have a lot of discussion as to why it is so, but it's a very interesting kind of finding. Because the other side of the story, and it's because I've slipped for time, I'll slip over the particular thing, but it actually is much more efficient. To do it, the clinician time, having got all the information from the young person, actually is quite brief. It does not, so the issue about going to scale through technologies can emerge. Now it's very important to say that's what a skilled clinician looks like. This is a Colombian psychiatrist, Laura Ospina Palinos, working with our Prime Minister. And actually working with a young man who's in a faraway place in New South Wales, Broken Hill, you know, a thousand miles from there. To actually, and he's doing something unusual. There's no child psychiatrist within 500 miles. He's talking to somebody who's actually trained in Colombia, who's working with us at the same time. The issue about taking specialist care to other settings is really potentially possible. So just to conclude, we think we are developing new platforms of primary care services, but they're not primary care. They have specialised elements. They're transdiagnostic, they're early identification focused. We do need to promote a much greater international network of these sorts of activities if we're going to succeed. And there are major challenges. And I think the biggest one is really to get people to focus on functional outcomes and that we need to have our interventions designed for that purpose. We need to take into many of the studies, I would suggest, a much broader framework of people who are in these attenuated syndromes and study those effects. There are major challenges to happen. One is the demand. Whenever you open the doors, you will be flooded. So we think it's where the e-health things come in to, to deal with a lot of the distress of earlier stages more efficiently online and in less expensive ways and have the clinical services focus on those who are in greatest difficulty. In all of this, we've got to stop creating new barriers to care. And I just suggest that some of the things we do around diagnoses may create new barriers to care. The other thing is, of course, engendering hope through the genuine partnerships. And I think that eat health is often misunderstood as somehow keeping people at bay. Many of the young people we work with love it. It actually engenders actually engagement with the process and ongoing monitoring. And that you know, we're going to build services. We're building it for a mountain of people. We're not building it for individually small numbers of people with individual disorders. I just thought finally, a very unusual thing happened two weeks ago that the Nobel Prize Committee should, you know, give Bob Dylan, for those of us of a certain age, Nobel Prize for Literature. But I do think, you know, there has been, and it's a great credit to this organisation, that much of the psychosis area might have been summed up by Bob's famous uh, line, nothing really matters much, it's doom alone that counts, you know. You know, that really your area has been transformed by your enthusiasm and your commitment to the early intervention type area. I think in all services, there is an issue that we make sure whatever we do, that we actually do provide shelter from the storm for young people in a lot of trouble. But I think we all got to move to something else, which is really the diagnosis doesn't really matter much. It's a better future that really counts. Thanks.